Let's go ahead and get this NRAC meeting started today, July 10th. Welcome, everybody. So, Sean, should we start with an icebreaker? Oh, uh, before the icebreaker, let's go or... with, uh, yeah, no, 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 just super quick. Um, for those of you who are joining us, um, and uh, this is a first for us, uh, for NRAC, to have uh, this many folks uh, using this platform. Wanted to share with uh, all members and people in the public, this is being recorded and that the recorded mess, uh, this whole meeting will be uploaded to NRAC's webpage or homepage uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, just want to make sure everyone's understanding that this is recorded because we usually just do minutes. Uh, and more is this absolutely wonderful who is uh, hosting this in our uh, BOC office. So with that, Deb, if you want to hit the icebreaker, let's sure. do it. Sure, you bet. All right. So as a reminder, I'll uh, let you know what the question is. I'll select the first person. If you will respond and then select the next individual, we should be able to make our way around the room. So the question is, if you could remove one item from Coffin Butte's landfill, what would it be? Let's start with you, Jason. One, like globally, one particular kind of item. Yep, never to see the landfill again. Mm. How general can I be? Like all electronics? <laughs> <laughs> sure, um, why not? I'll, I'll say all electronics, but um, you know, even just eliminating batteries, uh, any kind of battery, um, because they contain the most toxic and caustic and problematic uh, active metals in the landfill, and they cause the most problematic cleanup efforts, I think. Um, my close second is PFAS, but that's not really even one thing. So anyway, I'll go with batteries. <laughs> Great. And um, they're not supposed to be uh, landfilled, but, you know, people. So they get thrown away. They get included in things. Yeah, um, I'll popcorn this to Sydney. What's your item? I have like two really big ones, but I'm just going to say one. So I will have to say like recyclable plastic, because if we recycled all that plastic, it would save a ton of energy and a ton of money instead of making all of that new plastic all the time. Um, I will pass it to Bailey. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about this and food is definitely my choice. Um, it is what uh, leads to the creation of methane in the landfill and is just, um, you know, a shame to waste when it still has value. I'll pass it to uh, Damiola. Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, you did. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, so Sydney, uh, you went for what I was going to go for. So I was going to go for uh, recyclables, um, especially plastic and e-waste. All right. So I'll, I'll still stick to recycle uh, recyclables. However, I would go for e-waste and appliances that constitute so, um, um, CO2 emission. Thank you. So I'll pass to... I'll pass to Vance, Vance Crony. <laughs> Thank you, Damiola. Um, I think I'm going to echo Jackson and go with batteries, not just car batteries, but all batteries in general. The, uh, the liquids in car batteries are off, obviously acidic and, and, and really tough to remove, plus the heavy metals from the uh, batteries in, them, in and of themselves, uh, I think, create significant challenges for the landfill. Uh, and I'm sorry, did I say Jackson? I meant Jason. I just gave you an extra C and a K in your name, Jason. Sorry. <laughs> um, how about, how about if I go to Jackson? Hi. Um, each time I've picked an item, someone else has picked it, um, which is very unfortunate. So I'm going to go with just steel because there's a lot of steel that gets thrown away and that is very in energy intensive to mine. 
And how about Deb? All right. Well, so as not to repeat anyone, and no offense, Jason, but I'm a proponent of getting diapers out of the landfill. And believe it or not, they don't just apply to babies. <laughs> so I hear you. <laughs> yep. It's kind of a one end of life and the other. So that would be my choice. All right. How about you, Sean? I'm going food. Uh, I don't care. You know, it's fine. Echoing. I think that's something that we can get out of, of the waste stream um, or at least incredibly diminish it. So um, is that everyone? They didn't want to go. Unless you want to include Mara. Oh, yeah. Mara. Sorry. You're, I didn't see it. Oh, I guess not. Oh, there she goes. Oh, here she comes. I would go well. I know there are two others dead, but um, that one's been on my mind lately too, in terms of the methane gas. Great. Well, that's a nice comprehensive list. So just imagine what we might be able to do if that wish list were to become a reality. So let's keep that in mind. All right. Sounds good. So uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to at least scan the meeting minutes from last month, we have enough, uh, good enough information to be able to approve the June minutes. All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Here, here. Okay, unless there's any declines, we're good. All right. It's all yours, uh, Sean, unless you want me to ask about community updates, any events that we need to know about. Does anybody have anything, any shout outs for opportunities that we should be aware of? All right, hearing none, I'll pass it along to you, Sean. All right. Um, okay, so I wanted to give a little bit of a background, not just for those uh, members of the public that might be joining, but also for you. Uh, some things happened last Tuesday during the Board of Commissioners meeting. So just kind of want to start with a general last month or so uh, to bring so everyone's on the same page because I think a couple of members actually missed the meeting. So um, back in May, uh, I came to uh, this body with a request uh, from the county to uh, if, if members would be willing to provide recommendations to the county's planning commission on uh, the expected expansion application from Republic Services uh, at Coffin View. Uh, we had a discussion then. Uh, we had uh, staff provide presentations to you. And so you all had an opportunity to, uh, to deliberate <coughs> uh, last meeting. I felt that the uh, conversation was completely fair and robust. Um, there was consensus that was attained. Uh, not everyone had was, you know, there wasn't 100% unanimity, but I thought everyone's uh, comments were fair and appreciated by all members. Uh, consensus was uh, met that NREC would uh, accept the request to provide recommendations to the Planning Commission. Um, Last Tuesday, and Vance will have to help me with the appropriate verb, the commissioners approved, genuflected, whatever it is, um, the request. <clears throat> there was a, uh, a document that was shared, and that document was accepted by the uh, Board of Commissioners for you to provide recommendations on the expected expansion application. So just want to make sure everyone understood that that was the process. Um, and Deb and Vance helped me out if I mischaracterized that, that process. Uh, and then this is our first meeting in which uh, the three of us, and hopefully Petra will be able to, uh, to join us. Uh, the, Vance Crony, uh, Petra, who is in our community development along with Bailey, to begin the process of giving you background information and things to consider on uh, the recommendation that you will be providing. That is, in general, the past month or so. Um, I did want to share, uh, for full disclosure, two items. One, uh, there have been emails and information has already started sharing uh, with members uh, internally. You all have found information and shared. And uh, on looking at landfills in general, as and also Coffin Butte specifically, 
Deb, I hope that's fair, a fair assessment of some of the, the communication that's been going on. Um, and that is all over the place, all, all, all different kinds of environmental impacts uh, of landfills and coffee beans specifically. But I did want to start this off with one thing. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful to you, Deb and Jason, you've been here the whole four years and, and you new members, um, that there has been trust built by the county and me staffing your this organization. Uh, there were a couple comments last month uh, and as early as today, we want you to understand that we're taking this very seriously and objectively. No decisions have been made at all. Um, Vance and I have talked about this, commissioners, planning commission, planning commissions are volunteers just like yourself. And there is your, we value you as volunteers and this is not a rubber stamp or anything like that. This is you having your voice and your voice will be heard on this. And I just want to make sure that's, that's important and that that's conveyed. Um, we do, we, we really value the time that you put in this and you uh, the recommendation will be given to the planning commission and as is, it is not our job um, uh, to guide you in any way, but to answer any and all questions you have. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over first. Uh, what we had planned, the three, uh, the three of us and Vance and Bailey, uh, Petra came in on the public side. I'm gonna get her the link right now. Uh, Vance is gonna start off with more of the legal issues to set the stage. Petra in our planning and zoning is going to set more of the, uh, what is expected of the CUP process. We'll should get into that. And then Bailey, who is our solid waste manager uh, is gonna kind of get a, a little history and background of Coffee Butte. So that's kind of setting the stage. If everyone's okay, Vance, uh, take it away. Thanks, Sean. So what the document that uh, Sean was referring to on Tuesday, the board um, approved an order delegating a duty of the Solid Waste Advisory Committee to NRAC. And that, is, and that duty is the um, responsibility to review and make recommendations on a conditional use permit application to expand the landfill. Um, obviously, you know what that is because you've had a couple of meetings where you talked about that. The order that the board approved last week um, tracks very, not very closely, it tracks um, identically with the Benton County Code provisions that describe the type of review you'll be engaged in. And while it doesn't talk about the time frame, I'll get to talk about the time frame. So I think one of the most important things to understand is that your review of a land use application is limited by the language in our development code. Specifically, Sydney has her hand up already. I haven't even gotten no, to I'm sorry, that was an accident. That was an accident. Okay. <laughs> so the, the order contains language that it comes straight out of our development code, which is uh, development code chapter 77.305. And that code provision, and I will just read it to you because it is, it, like I said, it describes the scope of your review. And it says that you shall review and make recommendations through the planning official to the planning commission regarding the site development plan map and narrative. Chapter 77.310, and, and I can send this out to Sean, and Sean can send it out to, to all of you so you can see it, but chapter 77.310, subsection 2, describes what that site plan map is. So you're not just freeforming it, so to speak. You're not just trying to figure out what you're reviewing, our development code tells you what you're reviewing. And then in chapter 77.310, subsection two, it describes the elements of that application that you are being asked to review and provide recommendations on. So that's that's a significant piece because again, that's those are your sideboards. Um, the other element that is important to note is 
you have complete discretion over how you wish to conduct your review. You can assign tasks to each member, each uh, committee member. You can create a subcommittee around different topics. You can uh, basically, you can create the process for reviewing this application however you choose with one caveat. You are, the board's order states there will be no public hearing on your review. And that really is, the, there's two reasons for that. The, the first is it's not NRAC's job, just like it was not SWAC's job to conduct a public hearing on the land use application, because that's essentially what would happen. That's why we have the planning commission. The planning commission's task is to evaluate that application, listen to testimony, take evidence, and then adjudicate, reach a quasi-judicial decision on that application. So the public hearing process is in place and it does provide an opportunity for uh, the public, for the applicant, for opponents, for proponents, other governmental entities to provide evidence and testimony. That's not a task that we're asking NRAC to perform. And the second, which is maybe even more important, is the time frame within which you're going to be asked to provide your review and then a recommendation is very tight. The clock for your review won't start until an application is deemed complete by the planning department staff reviewing it. So between that date and the date the planning commission holds its first meeting will be when your review and recommendation takes place. And that's even more truncated because your recommendations need to be submitted to the planning commission uh, a little bit ahead of their hearing date so they can actually review it. So the time frame within which you need to do all this work is very short. And to try to add in the, uh, the legal steps required for a public hearing simply would make that time frame too short to, to accommodate that kind of, of an effort. So carte blanche to, do how, to, to review this how you please with the exception of no public hearing. Questions on, on the board's order and those two elements, the, the specification of your scope of your review and uh, how you to conduct your review. All right, I don't see Sydney's hand up, so we must be good to go. If I might, uh, and it looks like Deb too. Um, I'm looking at the Ben County land use application process, and I see a lot of what you just mentioned. Um, just to make sure, I clarified my sense. Uh, like once it's labeled complete, there's a 150 day process to go between the application, uh, the staff understanding, and then staff review. And then how you keep saying that it's a short process and I believe you, but what, how long is that process on that, on that application process chart that I'm, I'm looking at? So from the date that the application is deemed complete, the Oregon law specifies that uh, a local government, Benton County, must reach a final decision within 150 days. And the final decision is the board of commissioner decision. Okay. So what we then, yep. So then you start back in time out from 150 days. Um, and I, Petra can answer this probably a little bit more clearly, but when she and I chatted about this, that time frame within which the 30 day with the completeness date is established and the planning commission is probably going to be around 60 days um, in that time frame. I know we talked about that before too, but that'll that'll help. Thanks. Good, good. Yes, ma'am. Sydney. Not a question, just a comment. Yesterday in the meeting with Republic Services, they mentioned that they were planning on submitting their proposal um next week. Okay. And that and that tracks with what we have been guessing. Um, there was a pre-application conference, what I think, two, meeting two weeks ago, and they said it would be a week or two or three, so. Okay. Right. Um, Just real quick, I presume that we will have questions along the way, and that Sean is our primary point of contact for those questions, then to distribute to whomever can provide the correct 
response? Um, I think it, at this stage, probably yes. Um, if, however, it looks like you're having a lot of questions, you know, then maybe I should plan to to or myself and Petra should plan to maybe uh, attend your next meeting just so that everybody can hear the same answers at the same time. So, yes, with the caveat that we're willing to adjust if if necessary. Great, thank you. And I know where Vance sits. <laughs> yes, he does. Okay, so I think the, the one of the questions that um, you had asked originally when the question came before you, do you want to take on this this task? Was how do we how do we do this review? Um, and which was a really good question because this is not something you've been asked to do before, probably are not going to be asked to do again in the future. So it truly is a one off, and so there is no template, there's no roadmap for you guys. Um, and I, and I will say, even SWAC, who had originally performed this task back uh, in 2021 and last time an application was filed, it's so long between applications that process change, people change, experience change, um, knowledge of the processes goes away. So we're almost always inventing it each time there's an application. With, with that said, I went to the NRAC bylaws to help me answer this question. You are not SWAC. You are NRAC. You were you asked to be part of this Citizens Advisory Committee because you have a passion and an interest in the environment and our natural resources here in Benton County. And that's why we have this committee. That committee provides input and feedback to the Board of Commissioners and to other departments on those environment and natural resource issues. Your bylaws specifically state that your function, and I'm going to pull up your bylaws just so that I have it in front of me. Your bylaws describe your function as researching topics and providing input related to Benton County's 2040 vision statement on environment and natural resources. And here's the and here's the statement that defines your function. Benton County commits to protect, conserve and enhance our treasured limited natural resources and prepare, and prepare for future environmental challenges. So I would condense that to your function is to review research and provide input related to our natural resources and prepare for future environmental challenges. That's your function. And what I would say is how you review and make recommendations on a condition use permit application should be viewed through that statement, that 2040 vision statement, because that's your purpose. And I would ask you to ask yourself, how does the conditional use permit application relate to or impact that vision statement? Your answer to that question frames how you review the conditional use permit application because it should provide, Deb, you're already looking skeptical. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What I'm trying to get at is you have guidance in your bylaws for how you, for what you're supposed to do as a committee. That guidance should be the lens through which you assess this application. And it is that lens that provides you with the issues, the topics, the concerns, the areas of interest that you will pull out of that application to discuss and then to make recommendations on to the Planning Commission. Does that make a bit of sense? Am I Have I muddied the waters a bit? Um, it makes sense, but could you send like the, either the bylaws or should we just look up that vision statement? Sean? We have them. Got it. Yeah. Five seconds. Okay. 
Yeah, and it is that vision statement is right there, front and center on page one under article two, where it says function, and it, it is the in that first paragraph once Sean sends it. Um, and again, I'm not, I don't want you to think that you are becoming the solid waste advisory committee because that's not what we are asking you to do. We are asking you to review this application as the Environment and Natural Resources Advisory Committee. Now it helps to have that perspective and context. That's the important and, part and, and, and I know this was a big, uh, you know, a, a real question of concern and, I, and I've given it some thought and, and hopefully this, this gives everybody, um, I, I guess, some, some reassurance that you're being asked to take on this task within your comfort zone within your areas of interest, knowledge, expertise, and experience. So, maybe any question? A real quick uh, clarifying question, perhaps, because I've been, since I was poking around the website uh, today, I noticed that um, there is a plan to create a disposal site advisory committee, the DSAC. Maybe can you comment on what that planning looks like and where you're at in that process? I know it's not completed by any means, but um, how that relates to future planning. DSAC, you mean? Yeah. Um, DSAC, had the uh, members have been appointed and that committee meets, I believe, at the end of this month for the first time. And... Uh, but, and I see Bailey nodding his head. Um, Bailey, I think, can speak to that a little bit more. Well, give him the thumbs up. So it has been reconstituted. It is meeting for the first time in July, and it should be up and running in July, at the end of July. That get all or half of the question? Um, I guess I'm curious how DSEC because it sounds like it's related to this process or like the intention of the landfill, what their purview in the future will be. Not that it's going to change our, our review process. I'm just curious. Yeah, but it really doesn't have anything to do with this conversation right now. But to answer your question, the purpose of DSEC is to provide a, an, a forum for the exchange of information, concern, ideas, plans between the community, the county, and Republic Services. Kind of a, a three-way stakeholder um, dialogue. That's, that is what DSAC is intended to do. Um, and just to clarify, because Republic Services has a sitting member on the DSAC committee, that is the fundamental reason why this task of reviewing the application didn't go to DSAC. So that's helpful. Okay. Um, and I think if you don't have any of the questions on how you put yourself into this corner um, and how you are to perform your, 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 this particular task, I'll turn it over to uh, either Petra or Bailey um, to take on the next, next aspect. I think Logically, and I hope Pedro's here, um, logically, the next aspect should be uh, discussion of the land use um, process. Oh, there she is. Yep. I'm here. Just came in the wrong door. <laughs> I get Pedro sheets. I'm the interim community development director, but also the planning director here. Um, it's my primary role. So um, in terms of what you'd like to hear about the land use process is just like the steps. Is Is that... What do you think this uh, committee is going to be interested in? Petra, I think the, the steps is one. I know that we were talking earlier about uh, the timing, but mm -hmm. also your expectations to the planning commission, which the community development staffs, you know, with, whether it's format, uh, rationale, the length, like that kind of thing. What do you think is going to be helpful for the planning commission to review? Vance perfectly mm -hmm. said um, it's kind of what NREC wants to make of it, but any direction think on that um, would be great. Yeah, and I really don't have any perspective on it um, in terms of uh, like, a, like a personal opinion or departmental opinion on how they should, but I do absolutely agree with the rationale that Rance has given you. 
Um, and I was trying to figure out, you know, where do they fit in um, with the other folks that review? And there's a process where after an application is complete, then um, you, you notice uh, the public to say when you're going to be having the public uh, hearings and such that are out of ways and give the public plenty of time uh, to understand when that's coming down. But then uh, what we do is take the application materials and send them to all the agency, what we call agency referral partners. And those are folks who have authority, a stake, um, a regulatory responsibility, something of that nature. And the planning department is kind of the nexus for making sure that all of those agencies um, have an opportunity to review the application in their respective areas of expertise. For example, the, the uh, uh, ODF and W, um, Oregon um, Wildlife, um, Fish and Wildlife, they'll be looking at impact on wildlife. And um, DEQ, of course, will be looking at in, envi other environmental um, and water uh, and such. And so I think that that's exactly when uh, NRAC will be receiving the information to the application, uh, along with the other agency referral partners. So um, I hope that answers the question about where NRAC fits in in the process. Um, and then usually there's about a two week, sometimes a three week period um, for that review. I ask for comments from everybody. And then I will synthesize all of those comments um, in my staff report. Um, most of the time I can use the comments and, and suggested conditions uh, verbatim. Sometimes I put them in and I will make my own assessment of that so that planning commission has um, maybe a couple different ways of looking at it. So I just provide some guidance on for planning commission to make um, decisions if the comments are ambiguous, for example. Um, so, but ultimately I'm just the guidance person, staff person, planning commission then will use all that information to make their discretionary decision on the application. So, so Petra, um, I had, Jason had asked a question about the timing and I had um, said that I thought the time frame within which NRAC will be making it, conducting its review and providing its recommendations from the date the application is complete to the date that uh, the planning commission holds its first public hearing will be a roughly 60 days. Is that accurate? I, I want you to make sure that if I'm inaccurate, that the, the NRAC has the right information. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I kind of misunderstood um, what aspect you were speaking of. I, unless agency referral partners want more time, we generally give about 30 days for that um, application uh, process. But if it's, if it's too complex and there's a request for more time, I have no problem extending it. I just need to be able to uh, extend that for all the agencies um, and be able to communicate that. So essentially then NRAC will have between 30 and 60 days, 30 and 45 days to do its review, hold its meeting, reach its recommendations, and then synthesize that into a document that goes to planning commission. Yeah. And it's good that this is a unique situation for me. I've not uh, had a relationship with the um, entity like NRAC before with a quasi-judicial process. And so if, for example, it's a whole committee work and that's not like the other agencies, right? They have a staff person that's dedicated to this. So I'm just, I'm just thinking off the cuff, you know, if you need to have a meeting and you need enough time, you know, to do that um, and, and process that and you need more time to do it, I, I don't see any problem with that. I mean, there's no statutory limit to when the comments can come in, but I would like to be able to start synthesizing the other agencies' comments um, and keep them to their kind of deadline that they're that standard um, for them. So, I mean, do you have any problem with that, Vance? I mean, if they need more time to incorporate their comments, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I I don't have any. I don't have a problem. Um, we talked about the 150 day timeline. I think one of the things that um, uh, the folks on NRAC will need to be mindful of is that the sooner you can dissolve your comments to a recommendation, 
the sooner the planning commission members can have that in hand to consider when they're evaluate, evaluating all the other evidence, testimony, and information. So it's, it's preferable to have that information submitted to the planning commission earlier rather than later. Um, so, so I want to follow up on something Petra, Petra said about witnesses. Um, one way to look at your role is very similar to what Petra said, much like an agency, let's say it's DEQ, providing technical input and recommendations. That doesn't mean your recommendations carry more weight or less weight than a member of the public who testifies at a public hearing. It means, however, that you do, your recommendations come with some gravitas, some experience, some interest, some level of expertise that a lot of community testimon testimonials and evidence may not have. So you do have, you do carry a little bit more cachet with the planning commission so that, uh, that is why we ask the committee to provide the recommendations. And the second thing I wanna pass along is when SWAC provided its recommendations back in 2021, they, they sent two letters to the planning commission. The first was a very short letter that said, we endorse and, and recommend approval of the application. And that's fine, that's just fine. It followed that up I want to say, what, two and a half months later with still a very, a fairly short letter, but it contained two recommendations that were born out of additional thought and consideration. And having looked at those two letters, it seems to me, and this is just one person's opinion, but because you do have greater expertise, greater interests um, in the environment and the natural resource area, hence your appointments, that for you to provide recommendations based on your background and interests would be a benefit to the planning commission as it reviews the application, whether to approve or deny. And if, if they're leaning toward approval, it could help shape conditions of approval that would benefit uh, the community, the environment, uh, Benton County, as well as Republic Services. So probably, a, well, I think that says it all. Sean, did you have your hand up a little bit uh, a couple minutes ago? I did. Thanks, Deb. Um, one of the questions that came on, I forgot if it was the mayor, <coughs> mayor last month, um, to just to be specific and to focus in for you and rec members, you are not obligated to read or go investigate all these other uh, entities that Petra said. Uh, I know that it came up like this isn't you having to spend weeks and weeks and weeks reading every little uh, opinion by DEQ or EPA or whatever it is, that's on their track. You can focus on your track and just to make sure that you're aware um, and that, and hopefully that's correct, Petra Advance, um, that this is your voice. You don't have to wait or read for all the other ones. So again, hopefully uh, making sure that your time is focused um, and that we respect that time. So. Petra, do you have anything else to add on the land use front? No, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, Should we? we uh, have... mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Vance. Nope, I'm, I'm sorry. I was going to kick it over to Bailey, but if somebody else has a question, please, please ask Petra. Well, we actually have a written list of questions. And <laughs> if you're okay, I would like to just kind of start from the top and work our way down. I uh, anticipate several of them might not need to be asked as we move through the process. Would that be okay with everyone? Sure. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So uh, are there going to be any environmental or social impact assessments being conducted officially regarding this proposed expansion? And will it inform the decisions, which I would hope it would, but any assessments? that you can tell us about? Petra, that's all Me. yours. Yeah, so 
uh, we haven't seen the application yet, but we did at our pre-application meeting um, go down a list of um, what our expectations were in terms of assessments and reports. So they're hydrogeological, noise, sound, in environmental impact um, to fish and wildlife, um, that, that type of a thing. And I'm sorry, this is off the top of my head. Um, a s smell, light. Air quality. Uh, yes, pollution, air quality, yes. Um, so that also includes uh, like wind trends and things of that nature. Um, to the extent how one of the, the things that staff's going to be the core technical responsibility is to assess um, the information in these technical reports to see whether or not staff agrees or disagrees. And we have a third party um, on retention um, to help um, in areas where we don't have uh, specific expertise um, as a county. Um, so uh, rest assured, we're going to get some good uh, third party uh, technical analysis on the content of all of those um, um, all of those reports. Um, and so Republic Services has hired out uh, contractors in all of those areas to do third party uh, studies to add to their application. So we expect to see all of those. And if we don't see all of those reports, then they will have an opportunity to um, develop the reports and add that to the application during the um, completeness review period. So that's that 30 day period at the beginning. Um, so we will make sure that all those reports um, are uh, in the application. Okay, so any assessments conducted by Republic's third party uh, contractors, those will be made publicly available, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we, we're, do, we're not posting the application um, right. before the 30 day period, but um, the public can have access once the application is deemed complete. Um, to look at the, all the materials. And as an agency referral partner, NRAC, you will be receiving all the application materials. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, regarding any future public engagements so that they have an opportunity to learn more, can you describe the uh, you know future Zoom meetings, in-person meetings where the public can participate in the decision-making process or or are those public engagements complete? Uh, no, they haven't started yet. <laughs> okay. Just so from a from right. a from a land use from a from the land use application perspective, it's it's a highly regimented process. So um, there could be all kinds of public outreach that's happening and Republic services can do all they want to as they're as they host um, public outreach. Um, other Entities can have events, that kind of thing. But the planning commission, once that application is deemed complete, the planning commission is not to be having conversations with the public until uh, the public hearings. And if they happen to have conversations, they need to disclose that information at the public hearing as ex parte contact. Okay, because they want to keep the, the whole trans idea of the transparency is that there aren't any, that everybody has the right to the same amount of information at the same time. Um, so when I set out a public notice, it'll open up a public comment period. And during that public comment period, we will be taking in um, written public comments from folks. And that's all eligible to be part of the record for the land use application. So we're taking comments all the way up until one week before when I post the uh, the staff report um, and to the planning commission and post it on the website. Um, we take the written comments. Now you can you can have written comments um, from the time that is posted and up until the first public hearing that one week period but I batch them and hand them out to the planning commission once so that we don't have papers and flying through distribution lists and things getting lost and such. So that's, that's that process for the written public comment. 
So then there's going to be a public hearing at the first um, meeting of the land use application. And the first thing that happens is public comment. So uh, we will take as long as it takes to get through all the public comments. In fact, the planning commission chair anticipating a lot of public testimony, verbal public testimony, um, we're probably set tentatively setting up iterative days just so, just in case we can't even get through the staff report, you know, in the first meeting because there's that many public comments. But we want to make sure that we're not going like one month with just public comments and then having to wait for the next month. So we might have one, Wednesday is public comments, the next day is uh, the staff report. But it just depends on how much interest and how much public comment we get. But just to think forward, we're tentatively going to do that so that there's plenty of time for folks to do that. Now, we uh, generally the planning commission chair will set some um, guidelines to the public, um, particularly for um, land use applications that have a lot of interest, suggesting things like, please limit your comments to five minutes. Or if you're going to say the exact same thing that the person before you said, go ahead and introduce yourself and just say, I agree with what that person said. And just as a matter of decorum, we encourage people to do that um, just to keep order um, and respect and to allow the planning commission to eventually get to their, their business of deliberation and such. So um, I, I hope that answers your question, but those are the public, uh, the public interaction, public hearing, written comment opportunities that are on the record of the application itself. And when I say on the record, I mean, those are the comments that allow those interested parties to be party to an appeal process, for example. So you have a little bit different standing if you're on the record. If you go, let's say you, you have a public comment to the board of commissioners meeting, that's not gonna be in a packet um, for the application. It can't be, it has to be in this, process that I just described. Great. All right. Well, I know we're um, time is scooting right along. So I'm just going to ask one question that I know has come up from several folks, both last night at the uh, virtual meeting and elsewhere. Does um, actually two questions. Do we know what the current status of the sustainable materials management plan is? In other words, what are the next steps briefly? Or do we know yet? Do you know yet? Sean and Bailey, I think that's your yep. unintended bailiwick. <laughs> yes, we, uh, Bailey and I presented uh, to the commissioners on Tuesday. Uh, we provided a timeline. Bailey and I are in the process of reaching out to uh, the solid waste staff experts, managers, coordinators, whatever it is, of the 13 Western Oregon counties. Um, and we're going to get a pulse of their perspective as we start to reach out and start looking at this long-term regional material management, not waste management, but looking at materials. Um, we will, uh, again, trying to capture that feedback uh, and then just start to basically answer the question. Right now with the uh, Ben Kenny Talks Trash, the estimated end of life for uh for Coffin Butte was 2037 to 2039. The question is, if that were to occur, how are we going to deal with material management in the next decade? And, and Bailey and I spoke to the Lincoln County expert, uh, Solid Waste, and if we're looking at that kind of a time frame, 10, 12 years, that's tomorrow. And so how can we as a region start answering these questions uh, sooner rather than later? And Deb, real quick, uh, Jackson also has his hand up. Oh, Jackson. Right ahead. Hi, um, I was curious if you could go into more detail on the third party people that will be doing all the research for us, um, or at least that um, Republic Services is having to do the research. If you could have more information on that, I would appreciate it. Just like how the, how those are people chosen and how we, if there's any fact checking done by the county or anything like that. Uh, 
Oh, so like, um, I'm sorry, who's a, who's doing an evaluation of the technical reports? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it it just it depends on what we what we see um, in the technical reports. Make sure that they're the the, the right types. Um, and so we don't know um, precisely who we're going to need uh, to get yet. Um, we do have kind of a list of. I'll give you an example. We have a list of transportation engineers contractors. Um, so we haven't contracted with anyone yet. Um, but this is pretty common that if you have subject um, experts that, that you've used before. Um, so for example, in a different jurisdiction, we use branch engineering always for our uh, transportation um, engineering uh, reviews and such. But um, at Benton County, um, this is, that was a terrible example actually, because at Benton County, um, our own engineering department can do that, that work. So um, just depending on the level of detail that we get, we'll have to make that assessment um, at a staff level um, who's going to be uh, doing those reviews. Um, but um, all that information will be in the reports, um, you know, who did the review and all of their findings. I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. It does. All right. And then uh, just one more question. Then in Bailey, I understand that you have a presentation you'd like to give us. Is that right? Okay. Sounds good. So one of the other uh, questions that come up has come up is, you know, there is the potential that Coffin Butte will be closed, whether it's in the near future or closer to 2037. And during the public meeting last night, it sounded as, as though there really haven't been any decisions made or information gathered. I'm wondering if anybody else on this call today has more concrete information about where Benton County or Coffin Butte solid waste would be transported to. So, I'll touch a little bit on that. Sorry, Vance. Uh, in my time, I'll be touching on those topics. Okay. So, so, and I would also, before Bailey gets into that, I will also um, say that that would be a function of almost exclusively the hauler contracts. So if you have haulers, let's say in Dallas or in Lincoln City, um, they are going to haul to wherever they can um, take the garbage to. So, and they will end up with contracts with the, the landfills that they end up taking the, the waste to, whether that's Arlington, whether that's uh, up in Washington, up by, I want to say there's a, one up in Longview, Kelso area. Um, there are facilities, but a lot of that depends, like I said, on the haulers and what kind of uh, agreements they're able to reach with the landfills. Hey, good to know. All right, are there, um, there's a number of other questions here, but I don't think that uh, it's anything that we can answer today because some of them are related to the answer that you just provided, Vance. Does anybody else have questions before we turn it over to Bailey? No? All right, let's transition then. It's all yours, Bailey. Great. I just need a moment to pull up uh, my screen to share with you all. Great. Uh, everyone can see that, hopefully. Hearing no nays. <laughs> I'll, I'll continue. Yep, all good. All good. Um, so I was asked. Uh, uh, to give a little background on the Coffin Butte landfill and its history. I'm going to speed through a lot of these slides and I'm going to do the thing to you that I hate when other presenters do, which is to um, read off the slides, but such is the case uh, today. So I'm going to give you um, a little background. Um, the native Kalapunians, Kalapunians uh, inhabited uh, this area, uh, including Coffin Butte and Soap Creek uh, Valley uh, for over 14,000 years. Um, in the early 1700s, uh, Europeans became, uh, you know, came to the area and 
uh, the mid 1800s pioneers began to settle and in the early 1900s um, farming began and that uh, led to the, the need for uh, roads. Before I continue, one thing I will say is um, I have a document that has a lot more detail. I was just trying to hit some of the highlights here. So from the 1940s uh, uh, is when Coffin Butte really began to begin to accept uh, waste. So um, the Camp Adair, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, the military base is just north of Adair Village. Uh, began and the Coffin Butte landfill, and you may see this throughout my slides, I say CBL, that just means Coffin Butte landfill, um, is uh, it was purchased uh, by a local business in 1947 uh, for waste disposal and incineration. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, in the 50s, uh, people began to be a little bit more aware that illegal dumping is an issue. Uh, it causes environmental issues, uh, rats, vermin, odor. Uh, really, if you look back at solid waste history, uh, that was really the impetus to start recycling. Well, actually, solid waste, you know, garbage uh, disposal programs. Uh, moving forward to 1952, uh, Bunn Brothers bought the landfill, and that's when they began encouraging local residents to. Uh, bring their waste to the landfill. In the 60s, um, burning was beginning to be phased out at the Coffin Butte landfill and elsewhere as well. Um, and they start to think about maybe this isn't the best place to have a landfill because of water quality issues. These are some historical photos. I don't know, can you see my mouse, my cursor? Um, so this is the Coffin Butte uh, landfill back in 1936, before it was a landfill. And the blue area indicates the, um, for context, the uh, Camp Adair. So this is a similar shot in 1944. It's pretty amazing because it wasn't there just a few years prior. 1944, it housed 50,000 people or whatever. And then uh, 55, you can see it's all gone. Uh, but the point of that is not Camp Adair, it's the landfill. Um, in the 70s, uh, the, the Department of Environmental Quality uh, started to notice that you know water and soil around the area had contaminants. And so at that time, they recommended that the landfill be closed. In 1972 and 73, great year, uh, uh they call it the Schmeketa region, really think of it as like the Mid-Willamette Valley, uh, began looking at, we need a regional disposal site. So keep that in your back pocket because I'm gonna come to it in a moment. So the landfill, um, the Coffin Butte landfill became the, the one that this, coalition of counties thought would make for the best location. Uh, at that time, uh, there was opposition from, from locals that lived around it. In 1974, Benton County Planning Commission approved a conditional use permit allowing for the expansion uh, to the uh, west. So the decision then was upheld by the Benton County Commissioners. And, in 75, the landfill uh, was purchased um, by uh, Valley Landfills. And you might recognize that name for any of you that are doing research in a coffin view and you come across Valley Landfills, uh, that's synonymous with uh, coffin view. It's the same thing. In 1977, uh, the old burn dump where they used to, and this is just horrible to think of, but People used to just bring their garbage, and this wasn't just here, it was, it was all over the place. They bring their garbage to a dump, they pour some gasoline on it, light a match, and away goes your garbage, right? So, um, 77, uh, they realized, you know, that became something they couldn't do, and so that, that area was closed. 
1983, uh, Benton County changed the comprehensive plan and created a landfill zone uh, at Valley, Valley Landfill's request. So Coffin Butte requested a, a re uh, designation and the planning commission agreed to it. Um, that meant that the landfill uh, was 194 acres uh, to the north of Cotton, Coffin Butte Road. So not, um, not the expansion area that they're now talking about. In 92, the DEQ uh, began looking into groundwater contamination and um, there was uh, Wa Chang over in Albany had brought a lot of material over that really they shouldn't have been accepting uh, in an unlined landfill back then. Um, one thing I'll point out, and I didn't add this to the um, presentation, but uh, the uh, RICRA rules in, at that, um, that were developed in the late 80s and then began to take effect in the early 90s really changed the landscape. I mean, literally, because it, what it essentially did was closed a lot of the smaller landfills throughout Oregon and really throughout the nation. And um, because the environmental um, precautions then that became mandatory for landfills, lining, drainage, leachate collection, the kind of things that you think of uh, when you think of a landfill now, uh, those were all absent. And they used to build them on the side of rivers and really inappropriate places. Uh, so that put rules in place that then uh, caused Coffin Butte and other larger landfills uh, to adapt and, and put in those liners and environmental protections. So in uh, 94, um, the uh, conditional use permit was also granted um, to the south of Coffin Butte Road uh, for a 2.2 megawatt power generation facility. So that's where they're capturing all of the methane. I imagine you, you've heard about this um, and they put it into generators and create electricity from that. Um, so the Benton County uh, Board of Commissioners also uh, denied Valley Landfills uh, an additional expansion request at that time. In 97, uh, the, uh, the conditional use was permitted on the south side of Coffin Butte Road uh, for the gas to energy facility that they have now. In 99, there was an unfortunate incident where a truck had a, um, some uh, combustion within it. It dumped into the landfill and created um, a fire, which clearly is concerning. Uh, this is a picture of the generator um, in, you know, next to Coffin Butte. Uh, in 83, Benton County um, uh, changed its comprehensive plan to create a, wait, I already did that one, sorry. <laughs> in 2000, uh, and, and by the way, this is a picture on the left of uh, drilling a vertical well uh, that goes in you know, down into the, they have horizontal wells and vertical wells uh, to capture methane. So um, Allied Waste uh, bought Coffin Butte Landfill uh, or Valley Landfills and uh, Benton County uh, Landfill Franchise Agreement extended that, extended that until 2020. 2002, uh, Benton County and landfill owners signed an MOU that required prior approval to use the south of Cotton Butte Road for waste disposal. So that's where we are today is the request to expand there. In 2005, the DEQ issued a record of decision on Coffin Butte groundwater mediation and said the site is in compliance. Now, keep in mind, because you may be wondering, well, they said earlier, you know, decades ago that it wasn't in compliance. Well, that was before the, the lining of landfills uh, and the groundwater management or leachate management and, and uh, air management, you know, those permits and the RICRA um, process began. In 2007, uh, they expanded the gas to energy 
you know, mining all that methane out of the landfill. In 2008, um, Coffin Butte was acquired by Republic Services. Uh, the intake in 2017 really jumped up, and that's something of note. I'll show you a graph in a moment, but it went from 553,000 tons up to 941,000. So a significant increase in how much waste, and that's remained fairly constant since. In 2019, um, going back to when they used to light the match and light the garbage on fire, um, that, of course, became, you know, not permitted way back when. So the, um, but there was still the remnants of all that unlined garbage uh, that had been burnt and uh, it, it wasn't in an appropriate spot. So they began excavating that old landfill and then moved all the contents of it into the new landfill or, you know, a lined, uh, one of their lined cells. Uh, in 2020, Benton County renews the landfill franchise through 2040. Uh, and this is an important, um, I don't know if it's important for your decision, but it's an important um, note is that um, the clause included, um, there was a clause in it uh, that includes if the tonnage cap of 1.1 million uh, tons uh, if they expand the landfill, that tonnage cap goes away. I'll say that one more time, just in case. So if the landfill expands, the limit of 1.1 million tons a year isn't uh, um, a, consider uh, a limit anymore. In 2021, um, you know, there were the wildfires and that brought, you know, a big increase, which is of concern for the life of Coffin Butte in my mind, just because um, we're prone to wildfires. And so there could be a big influx needed for capacity. Um, Republic Services filed a, a conditional use permit in 2021 to uh, place waste uh, south of Coffin Butte Road, where the current um, plan of expansion is also uh, but it was going to be much larger and it was going to remove, you know, take out the Coffin Butte Road and put garbage over it. Um, so that was denied by the Planning Commission, although it was approved at the time by the Solid Waste Advisory Council. Can we actually now pause these that numbers? And I'll... You bet. Um, yeah, I have like some questions. So you said that they relocated the the trash into like a lined one so is i i thought they said in the um beyond toxics webinar that there was still trash in the unlined portions of the landfill is that true or is that not true i'd have to be a hundred percent to answer it okay. and i can't do that right at the moment, but my understanding is that they have removed all of that and it's now in lined landfill and there's no more remaining from what I understand. Um, I can follow up with you, Sydney. Okay, and then my other question is, is that like burn dump site, like have they like been testing it to like make sure that it's like not filled with pollution still or is that something that's not open for the public to see with the data i um i know that republic has to do uh, you know water testing around their facility they do some air quality testing as well to measure for methane and carbon dioxide and such um yeah i i I'm sorry, but I'm not a hundred percent. But I'm I'm I feel pretty sure that it's being monitored by D, the Department of Environmental Quality um, because it's zoned as a landfill zone and it's part of their overall footprint. So my understanding is that would be um, regulated and monitored by DEQ. Okay, thank you for stopping, Bailey. 
Oh, you bet. Anyone else? This is the one that is, this graph really troubles me. And I'll start out, I, I don't know how well you can see it, but the green line here um, on the, the bottom end is how much, um, how many tons per, you know, per year that Benton County, this only Benton County, so there are a lot of contributors to the landfill. This is only looking at Benton County. But you can see that um, the amount of material that we've recycled or composted has been on a decline in the last few years. And it's been fairly flat for a long time. And that's, in my mind, discouraging <laughs> that I'd like to see that this chart is moving up, you know, and that we're, we're you know, recycling 60% of what's coming in. But right now our recovery rate is, um, that's the line in blue, if we can jump up here, recovery rate is 31 and a half percent, which is um, about as poor as it has been since we began measuring this. So the recycling rate's down. That's not good. I mean, down a lot. And um, the uh, tons recovered, you know, is reflected there. But here's why there's such a discrepancy is that uh, the tons disposed have gone up. So we're, re, we're producing in Benton County more garbage, we're throwing away more garbage than ever, than ever. So that's concerning to me. The thing, the, the scariest of these lines is the blue one here, this light blue is consumption. And that's everything that we recycle and, and compost and throw away. And the overall impact, and we don't have time for it here, but that's the, that is the trend that keeps me up at night um, because it's, it's uh, recycling and composting help. They really do, but um, not if we're generating more waste. It's, it's uh, a very small, um, you know, recycling is just a little piece of it. Generating that much waste is where the environmental burdens come. Um, Coffin Butte is a regional landfill. When I talked earlier about the Chemeketa plan, um, where neighboring counties were looking for a good spot, that was kind of the beginning of what has now turned Coffin Butte into a regional landfill. So uh, it's defined as accepting more than 75,000 tons a year from outside its immediate area. So arguably, um, Coffin Butte has been a regional landfill since the early 90s. Um, and I'm going to go to this one. So let's take a look at some of the landfills that are around. So Finley Buttes is one of the really big ones in Oregon. It's in a lot of ways a good location for landfill in that it's drier. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's isolated. They don't have as many water, uh, quality, you know, uh, contamination concerns. Um, and that's why you'll find many of the larger landfills out in Eastern Oregon. Uh, Columbia Ridge is another one. Uh, there's one right across the border, Roosevelt, that um, Republic Services owns. So when um, uh, Deb, I think it was, asked about where's our garbage going to go, if not there, these are probably the most likely candidates uh, for where it would end up going. Uh, continuing on, uh, Wasco County has a, a smaller landfill, but probably not where our stuff would go. Riverbend in McMinnville is basically closed. I suppose they haven't officially closed, but it's basically done. Um, Coffin Butte is, is what we're talking about. And then uh, we have some others that only accept uh, waste, or principally, I should say, accept waste from within their jurisdiction. So um, uh, Covanta or ReWorld, as it's now called, uh, is the only uh, garbage incinerator, waste to energy, they call it incinerator in Oregon. And that's, in my mind, doesn't have a lot, a lot of fear 
acres left in it. I think that's going to close. Currently, Marion County is the biggest contributor to Coffin Butte, and they're sending us about two thirds of their waste, and the other third going to Covanta. So if that closes, um, you know, they'll have to send it somewhere. Uh, Short Mountain is Lane County's landfill. Uh, another, you know, it's regional landfill, but the county, Lane County owns that landfill, so they can restrict where the waste comes from. Benton County doesn't have that uh, because it's not held, you know, it's not owned by Benton County. Uh, Roseburg has one. Uh, the one in Ben, the not, not landfill is closing, but they're about to build a new one. Uh, so those, those were some landfills, and this screen shows the amount. This is now, um, earlier I was showing you just Benton County information. Now this is looking at everything that Coffin Butte accepts. And you can see, as I mentioned earlier, between 16 and 17 is when the amount of waste received there really escalated. And it's been, you know, more or less hovering right around uh, the cap of 1.1 million tons a year. Down here are, um, and I imagine some of you have seen this, the, the blue ones you can kind of disregard. Um, it's less than 1% of all the waste they receive comes from these blue counties. So the ones of more concern or interest are um, Washington County, Marion County, Lynn County, Yam Hill, uh, Lincoln, these others here. And I'll finish just by saying, you know, I really, really appreciate, I, I know that all the people on the call that aren't participating in the meeting, I know, I know that you're all volunteers, you're interested in this because you care. And likewise, with all the people on NRAC, it's, um, it's really commendable that you're volunteering your time to, to help with this community issue. My last slide, um, that's me. <laughs> that should be Sean, uh, but here's my contact info and I am more than happy to answer additional questions and so on. Um, Bailey, um, yep. I did want to say to Deb's point, one of the things about the SMMP, the Sustainable Materials Management Plan that Bailey and I are working on, we have a contractor um, or a contract with a consultant and one of their two main initiatives is to develop a more robust map than what Bailey showed. That is all, any sort of waste, anything uh, already there proposed or even thought of. And so that's gonna give us much more insight to answer your question, Devin, and others, where would this go if it weren't for Coffin Butte? So that we anticipate to be completed in September. And then that's gonna be a major focus for the SMMP task force to look at and to discuss how we're moving forward with that. So I'd wanna put that in context, we have the, the CUP over here, but also the SMMP that's looking at long range. So anyway, just give that. And Sean, if I may, um, you know, I, I feel like I kind of ended things on a depressing note with those lines going in the wrong directions. Uh, but I will say that this is a really, really exciting time to be uh, in the solid waste uh, field and, and the, the things that are coming down the pike uh, through the Recycling Modernization Act, and we don't have time to get into that, uh, as well as additional um, producer uh, funded opportunities for Benton County are to me just really exciting. There's amazing, amazing things happening now. If, if I may, um, you mentioned uh, in your show, I can't remember if you mentioned, uh, Bailey, the 2016-2017 like, spike in increased tonnage. Was that from any particular um, events? Was that uh, from just things changing in the, the milieu of where things can go? Did another landfill like close or did, did a lot of waste generation happen that year or something? I 
I'd like to give you a good answer, and I just I don't fully. It's complicated. Know. I mean, I, there are some things that are attributed, like for instance, with the the fires and and uh, the communities that got burned. Uh, there was some some of that, say in twenty one. Um, uh, you know, COVID touches everything, so there there's some some anomalies, I'd say, in um, that data. Um, but generally, I'd say no. I think just generally, we are consuming more, we're buying more things and using more things. And uh, that's really the crux of where the environmental environmentalism comes in, is trying to reduce that level of consumption because of all the upstream impacts that it has. Um, I, I, I just can I can I just add to what Bailey said? I, I believe Jason, that's also when Riverbend began to oh. stop receiving waste from the metro area, which is when we began to see the increase in waste um, flow from Washington County. So I think that spike um, has a lot to do with Riverbend's. Um, they didn't close at the time, but they certainly began the process of closing. Vance, that's a great point. Likewise, Marion County at that time began sending uh, two thirds essentially of their waste down. So thank you, Vance. Well, that was very informative to say the least. Although I will say that fire, for example, thank the you. 2020 Beachy Creek fire probably had some impacts there too, just due to quite a few homes burned to the ground. And I would imagine that a lot of that debris cleanup ended here. So that's my guess, but Yeah, right. and there are also uh, changes like in the recycling side of, it used to be you'd walk in and see all the recyclables from the trucks and it would be pretty white because of all the newsprint. Well, newsprint used to be like 56% of, of the recycling and now it's 4%. And cardboard has gone up as we order more, you know, Amazon and such. And so the, the recycling stream, that's not exactly what we're talking about, but um, you know, things are always in flux. Yeah. Sean? Uh I did. Uh, it looks like Petra has a question, and then I will, I'll I'll uh, I'll make my statement after that, Petra. Yeah. No. This as a student, actually, Bailey, <laughs> can you talk just briefly about the impact of China Sword on the recycling? Yes. Um, it was um, in the um, early two thousands many, 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 um, if not like the majority of recycling collection systems uh, were collecting from, uh, you know, uh, began to move to the commingled system that we have today, where you put it on one cart and it gets sorted out somewhere else. For those of you that are as old as I am, uh, you'll remember the days when you used to have to separate every item out by its type. With that came uh, these facilities that would then package it all and it was cheaper to just send it all abroad and uh, China was the main recipient and so recycling rates um, on the surface appeared to be soaring and doing real well um, but it turns out that there's a lot of contamination in, in those materials that we were sending abroad and uh, China and other um, principally Asian countries stop wanting to be the the dumping grounds of what they saw as just a lot of garbage um, beyond the recoverables. So they put in a very strict um, quota where you can you, the contamination rate was had to be so low uh, that our systems couldn't really sort it to their specs. And so um, that created kind of a crisis in the recycling world about where those materials are going to end up. 
uh, what I'd like to think is that's ultimately as bad as that time period was, uh, it's led to much better, cleaner markets. That's a lot of what the Recycling Modernization Act is focused on, is being sure that material is going to the right place, it's being handled correctly, there's not, um, you know, dumping of, of things in foreign countries. Um, Deb, my, uh, my question is actually to Petra and Vance. Uh, I know time, we have like three, three to five minutes left and one want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, as far as next steps, Deb and I can, can connect in the, uh, the next day or so to kind of get out a, uh, a timeline. Petra and Vance, is there any indication of when the actual application uh, might be submitted? Um, I'm just trying to set up the members, the NREC members. Petra, you said, you still need two to three weeks to make sure it's complete and just trying to get a, a short time frame for when uh, NREC needs to uh, provide the recommendations. Well, and didn't, um, didn't Sydney say that uh, at a Republic uh, virtual um, presentation yesterday that they were looking at submitting next week? Sydney, nod your head if that's what you said. Yeah. Yep. So... I think from there, Petra. Then we then we begin the review, the completeness review. Correct. Uh, yep, it'll start right away. As soon as it comes in, it starts that thirty day clock. Um, they're a sophisticated enough client that I do not think that it's going to take us thirty days to review that. Um, and like I said, we have uh, I have help. I have some depth um, to go through that. Uh, so yeah, I can't imagine that taking more than uh, ten days uh, to get through that process. Um, so at that point, when you close that period, uh, I will immediately send out agency referral. So it will be in the next month if they actually drop the application. Unless there's something absolutely gaping in their application, and then they'll need to have a 30-day opportunity uh, to submit more materials. Yeah. So uh, just trying to check on the calendar, the next NREC meeting is on uh, August 14th. Uh, if you're saying that that would be complete, I think is the verb, um, by then at least there's something poor and right to chew on by next meeting. So, um, so Deb, you and I can set up uh, agendas and uh, a timeline uh, in the next couple of days just to prep for that. So, Deb? Okay, well, we are approaching 5.30. So are there any other comments, questions? Anything else we want to add for the good of the order before we exit for the day? I might just uh, mention or ask what, what NRAC wants to consider thinking about in the interim of waiting for the application to fully drop um, in our laps. Uh, is there anything else we want to meet on or think about or chat on email about our next steps for our process? I have my own ideas. <laughs> I, I welcome them. <laughs> um, Deb, how about we we communicate on that and set a framework yeah. and then send it out to the, is that okay with you? And I'm more yeah. than happy to do that. Yep. I love working documents in a Google platform where we can all begin to at least communicate through those written formats and then agree, yes, I'll do this by such and such a day upload documents, let the group know, et cetera. That would great. be good. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Well, Sean, unless you have something else you want to add about your items at the end of the agenda. I think I, I hit on, and we can do EDI at the, uh, later on. So yeah, okay. uh, I think I've made all the major comments from SMMP. I think Bailey would probably not for that, unless I missed something egregious, but I think we're good. Okay, sounds good. I'll make a motion. We close her up for shop, the shop today. And we'll see you. I'm sure we'll be hearing from uh, Petra or Sean soon. Yes, you will. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bailey. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Mm -hmm.